Chapter twenty three of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of seventeen fifty seven by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty three. Quote, but though the beast of game the privilege of chase may claim, though space and law the stag we lend, ere hound we slip, or bow we bend, whoever wrecked, where, how, or when, the prowling fox was trapped or slain? Unquote. From Lady of the Lake. It is unusual to find an encampment of the natives, like those of the more instructed whites, guarded by the presence of armed men well informed of the approach of every danger while it is yet at a distance the indian generally rests secure under his knowledge of the signs of the forest and the long and difficult paths that separate him from those he has most reason to dread but the enemy who by any lucky concurrence of accidents has found means to elude the vigilance of the scouts will seldom meet with sentinels near home to sound the alarm. In addition to this general usage, the tribes, friendly to the French, knew too well the weight of the blow that had just been struck, to apprehend any immediate danger from the hostile nations that were tributary to the crown of Britain. When Duncan and David, therefore, found themselves in the center of the children who played the antics already mentioned, it was without the least previous intimation of their approach. But, soon as they were observed, the whole of the juvenile pack raised by common consent a shrill and warning hoop, and then sank, as it were, by magic, from before the sight of their visitors. The naked tawny bodies of the crouching urchins blended so nicely at that hour with the withered herbage, that at first it seemed as if the earth had, in truth, swallowed up their forms. Though when surprise permitted Duncan to bend his look more curiously about the spot, he found it everywhere met by dark, quick, and rolling eyeballs. Gathering no encouragement from this startling presage of the nature of the scrutiny he was likely to undergo from the more mature judgments of the men, there was an instant when the young soldier would have retreated. It was, however, too late to appear to hesitate. The cry of the children had drawn a dozen warriors to the door of the nearest lodge, where they stood clustered in a dark and savage group, gravely awaiting the nearer approach of those who had unexpectedly come among them. David, in some measure familiarized to the scene, led the way with the steadiness that no slight obstacle was likely to disconcert into this very building. It was the principal edifice of the village, though roughly constructed of the bark and branches of trees, being the lodge in which the tribe held its councils and public meetings during their temporary residence on the borders of the English province. Duncan found it difficult to assume the necessary appearance of unconcern, as he brushed the dark and powerful frames of the savages who thronged its threshold, but conscious that his existence depended on his presence of mind. He trusted to the discretion of his companion, whose footsteps he closely followed, endeavoring, as he proceeded, to rally his thoughts for the occasion. His blood curdled when he found himself in absolute contact with such fierce and implacable enemies. But he so far mastered his feelings to pursue his way into the center of the lodge, with an exterior that did not betray the weakness. Imitating the example of the deliberate gamut, he drew a bundle of fragrant brush from beneath a pile that filled the corner of the hut, and seated himself in silence. So soon as their visitor had passed, the observant warriors fell back from the entrance, and arranging themselves about him, they seemed patiently to await the moment when it might comport with the dignity of the stranger to speak. By far the greater number stood leaning in lazy, lounging attitudes against the upright post that supported the crazy building. 
while three or four of the oldest and most distinguished of the chiefs placed themselves on the earth a little more in advance. A flaring torch was burning in the place, and set its red glare from face to face and figure to figure, as it waved in the currents of air. Duncan profited by its light to read the probable character of his reception in the countenances of his host, but his ingenuity availed him little against the cold artifices of the people he had encountered. The chiefs in front scarce cast a glance at his person, keeping their eyes on the ground with an air that might have been intended for respect, but which it was quite easy to construe into distrust. The men in the shadow were less reserved. Duncan soon detected their searching but stolen looks, which, in truth, scanned his person and attire inch by inch, leaving no emotion of the countenance, no gesture, no line of the paint, nor even the fashion of a garment, unheeded and without comment. At length, one whose hair was beginning to be sprinkled with gray, but whose sinewy limbs and firm tread announced that he was still equal to the duties of manhood, advanced out of the gloom of a corner, whither he had probably posted himself to make his observations unseen, and spoke. He used the language of the Wyandots or Hurons. His words were consequently unintelligible to Hayward, though they seemed by the gestures that accompanied them to be uttered more in courtesy than anger. The latter shook his head, and made a gesture indicative of his inability to reply. "'Do none of my brothers speak the French or the English?' he said in the former language, looking about him from countenance to countenance, in hopes of finding a nod of assent. Though more than one had turned as if to catch the meaning of his words, they remained unanswered. "'I should be grieved to think,' continued Duncan, speaking slowly and using the simplest french of which he was the master to believe that none of this wise and brave nation understand the language that the grand marquis uses when he talks to his children his heart would be heavy did he believe his red warriors paid him so little respect a long and grave pause succeeded during which no movement of a limb nor any expression of an eye betrayed the expression produced by this remark. Duncan, who knew that silence was a virtue among his host, gladly had recourse to the custom in order to arrange his ideas. At length, the same warrior who had before addressed him replied, by dryly demanding in the language of the Canadas, When our great father speaks to his people, is it with the tongue of a Huron? He knows no difference in his children whether the color of the skin be red or black or white, returned Duncan evasively, though chiefly he is satisfied with the brave Hurons. In what manner will he speak, demanded the wary chief, when the runners count to him the scalps which five nights ago grew on the heads of the Yengeese? They were his enemies, said Duncan, shuddering involuntarily, and doubtless he will say it is good. My Hurons are very gallant. Our Canadian father does not think it. Instead of looking forward to reward his Indians, his eyes are turned backward. He sees the dead Yingis, but no Huron. What can this mean? A great chief like him has more thoughts than tongues. He looks to see that no enemies are on his trail. The canoe of a dead warrior will not float on the Horican, returned the savage gloomily. His ears are open to the Delawares, who are not our friends, and they fill them with lies. It cannot be. See? He has bid me, who am a man that knows the art of healing, to go to his children, the Red Hurons of the Great Lakes, and ask if any are sick. Another silence succeeded this enunciation of the character Duncan had assumed. Every eye was simultaneously bent on his person, as if to inquire into the truth or falsehood of the declaration, with an intelligence and keenness that caused the subject of their scrutiny 
to tremble for the result. He was, however, relieved again by the former speaker. "'Do the cunning men of the Canadas paint their skins?' the Huron coldly continued. "'We have heard them boast that their faces were pale.' "'When an Indian chief comes among his white fathers,' returned Duncan, with great steadiness, "'he lays aside his buffalo robe to carry the shirt that is offered him. "'My brothers have given me paint, and I wear it.' A low murmur of applause announced that the compliment of the tribe was favorably received. The elderly chief made a gesture of commendation, which was answered by most of his companions, who each drew forth a hand and uttered a brief exclamation of pleasure. Duncan began to breathe more freely, believing that the weight of his examination was passed, and, as he had already prepared a simple and probable tale to support his pretend occupation, his hopes of ultimate success grew brighter. After a silence of a few moments, as if adjusting his thoughts, in order to make a suitable answer to the declaration their guest had just given, another warrior arose and placed himself in an attitude to speak. While his lips were yet in the act of parting, a low but fearful sound arose from the forest. It was immediately succeeded by a high, shrill yell that was drawn out until it equaled the longest and most plaintive howl of the wolf. The sudden and terrible interruption caused Duncan to start from his seat, unconscious of everything but the effect produced by so frightful a cry. At the same moment the warriors glided in a body from the lodge, and the outer air was filled with loud shouts that nearly drowned those awful sounds which were still ringing beneath the arches of the woods. Unable to command himself any longer, the youth broke from the place, and presently stood in the center of a disorderly throng, that included everything having life within the limits of the encampment. Men, women, and children, the aged, the infirm, the active, and the strong, were alike abroad, some exclaiming aloud, others clapping their hands with a joy that seemed frantic, and all expressing their savage pleasure in some unexpected event. Though astounded at first by the uproar, Hayward was soon able to find its solution by the scene that followed. There yet lingered sufficient light in the heavens to exhibit those bright openings among the treetops, where different paths left the clearing to enter the depths of the wilderness. Beneath one of them, a line of warriors issued from the woods and advanced slowly toward the dwellings. One in front bore a short pole, on which, as it afterwards appeared, were suspended several human scalps. The startling sounds that Duncan had heard were what the whites have not inappropriately called the, quote, death halo, unquote, and each repetition of the cry was intended to announce to the tribe the fate of an enemy. Thus far the knowledge of Hayward assisted him in the explanation, and as he now knew that the interruption was caused by the unlooked-for return of a successful war party, every disagreeable sensation was quieted in inward congratulation for the opportune relief and insignificance it conferred on himself. When at the distance of a few hundred feet from the lodges the newly arrived warriors halted, their plaintive and terrific cry, which was intended to represent equally the wailings of the dead and the triumph to the victors, had entirely ceased. One of their number now called aloud in words that were far from appalling, though not more intelligible to those whose ears they were intended, than their expressive yells. It would be difficult to convey a suitable idea of the savage ecstasy with which the news thus imparted was received. The whole encampment, in a moment, became a scene of the most violent bustle and commotion. The warriors drew their knives, and flourishing them, they arranged themselves in two lines, forming a lane that extended from war party to the lodges. The squaws seized clubs, axes, or whatever weapon of offense first offered itself to their hands, and rushed eagerly to act their part in the cruel game that was at hand. Even the children would not be excluded, 
that boys little able to wield the instruments tore the tomahawks from the belts of their fathers and stole into the ranks apt imitators of the savage traits exhibited by their parents large piles of brush lay scattered about the clearing and a wary and aged squaw was occupied in firing as many as might serve to light the coming exhibition as the flame arose its power exceeded that of the parting day and assisted to render objects at the same time more distinct and more hideous the whole scene formed a striking picture whose frame was composed of the dark and tall border of pines the warriors just arrived were the most distant figures a little in advance stood two men who were apparently selected from the rest as the principal actors in what was to follow the light was not strong enough to render their features distinct though it was quite evident that they were governed by very different emotions while one stood erect and firm prepared to meet his fate like a hero the other bowed his head as if palsied by terror or stricken with shame the high-spirited duncan felt a powerful impulse of admiration and pity toward the former though no opportunity could offer to exhibit his generous emotions he watched his slightest movement however with eager eyes and as he traced the fine outline of his admirably proportioned and active frame he endeavored to persuade himself that if the powers of man seconded by such noble resolution could bear one harmless through so severe a trial the youthful captive before him might hope for success in the hazardous race he was about to run insensibly the young man drew nigher to the swarthy lines of the hurons and scarcely breathed so intense became his interest in the spectacle just then the signal yell was given and the momentary quiet that had preceded it was broken by a burst of cries that far exceeded any before heard the more abject of the two victims continued motionless but the other bounded from the place of the cry with the activity and swiftness of a deer instead of rushing through the hostile lines as had been expected he just entered the dangerous defile and before time was given for a single blow turned short and leaping the heads of a row of children he gained at once the exterior and safer side of the formidable array the artifice was answered by a hundred voices raised in imprecations and the whole of the excited multitude broke from their order and spread themselves about the place in wild confusion a dozen blazing piles now shed their lurid brightness on the place which resembled some unhallowed and supernatural arena in which the malicious demons had assembled to act their bloody and lawless rites. The forms in the background looked like unearthly beings, gliding before the eye and cleaving the air with frantic and unmeaning gestures, while the savage passions of such as passed the flames were rendered fearfully distinct by the gleams that shot athwart their inflamed visages. It will easily be understood that amid such a concourse of vindictive enemies no breathing time was allowed the fugitive. There was a single moment when it seemed as if he would have reached the forest, but the whole body of his captors threw themselves before him and drove him back into the center of his relentless persecutors. Turning like a headed deer, he shot with the swiftness of an arrow through a pillar of forked flame, and passing the whole multitude harmless, he appeared on the opposite side of the clearing. Here, too, he was met and turned by a few of the older and more subtle of the Hurons. Once more he tried the throng, as if seeking safety in its blindness, and then several moments succeeded, during which Duncan believed the active and courageous young stranger was lost. Nothing could be distinguished but a dark mass of human forms tossed and involved in inexplicable confusion. Arms, gleaming knives, and formidable clubs appeared above them but the blows were evidently given at random. The awful effect was heightened by the piercing shrieks of the women and the fierce yells of the warriors. Now and then Duncan caught a glimpse of a light form cleaving the air in some desperate bound, and he rather hoped than believed 
that the captive yet retained the command of his astonishing powers of activity. Suddenly the multitude rolled backward, and approached the spot where he himself stood. The heavy body in the rear pressed upon the woman and children in front, and bore them to the earth. The stranger reappeared in the confusion. Human power could not, however, much longer endure so severe a trial. Of this the captive seemed conscious. Profiting by the momentary opening, he darted from among the warriors, and made a desperate, and what seemed to Duncan, a final effort to gain the wood. As if aware that no danger was to be apprehended from the young soldier, the fugitive nearly brushed his person in his flight. A tall and powerful Huron, who had husbanded his forces, pressed close upon his heels, and with an uplifted arm menaced a fatal blow. Duncan thrust forth a foot, and the shock precipitated the eager savage headlong, many feet in advance of his intended victim. Thought itself is not quicker than was the motion with which the latter profited by the advantage. He turned, gleamed like a meteor again before the eyes of Duncan, and at the next moment, when the latter recovered his recollection and gazed around in quest of the captive, he saw him quietly leaning against a small painted post, which stood before the door of the principal lodge. Apprehensive that the part he had taken in the escape might prove fatal to himself, Duncan left the place without delay. He followed the crowd which drew nigh the lodges, gloomy and sullen, like any other multitude that had been disappointed in an execution. Curiosity, or perhaps a better feeling, induced him to approach the stranger. He found him standing with one arm cast about the protecting post, and breathing thick and hard after his exertions, but disdaining to permit a single sign of suffering to escape. His person was now protected by immemorial and sacred usage, until the tribe and council had deliberated and determined on his fate. It was not difficult, however, to foretell the result, if any presage could be drawn from the feelings of those who crowded the place. There was no term of abuse known to the Huron vocabulary that the disappointed woman did not lavishly expend on the successful stranger. They flouted at his efforts, and told him, with bitter scoffs, that his feet were better than his hands, and that he merited wings while he knew not how to use an arrow or a knife. To all this the captain made no reply, but was content to preserve an attitude in which dignity was singularly blended with disdain. Exasperated as much by his composure as by his good fortune, their words became unintelligible, and were succeeded by shrill, piercing yells. Just then the crafty squaw who had taken the necessary precaution to fire the piles made her way through the throng, and cleared a place for herself in front of the captive. The squalid and withered person of this hag might well have obtained for her the character of possessing more than human cunning. Throwing back her light vestment, she stretched forth her long skinny arm in derision, and using the language of the Lenape, as more intelligible to the subject of her jibes, she commenced aloud. Look, ye Delaware, she said, snapping her fingers in his face, your nation is a race of women, and the hoe is better fitted to your hands than the gun. Your squaws are the mothers of deer, but if a bear or a wildcat or a serpent were born among you, ye would flee. The Huron girls shall make you petticoats, and we will find you a husband. A burst of savage laughter succeeded this attack, during which the soft and musical merriment of the younger females strangely chimed with the cracked voices of their older and more malignant companion. But the stranger was superior to all their efforts. His head was immovable, nor did he betray the slightest consciousness that any were present except when his haughty eye rolled toward the dusky forms of the warriors, who stalked in the background, silent and sullen observers of the scene. Infuriated at the self-command of the captive, 
the woman placed her arms akimbo, and throwing herself in a posture of defiance, she broke out anew in a torrent of words that no art of ours could commit successfully to paper. Her breath was, however, expended in vain, for although distinguished in her nation as a proficient in the art of abuse, she was permitted to work herself into such a fury as actually to foam at the mouth without causing a muscle to vibrate in the motionless figure of the stranger. The effect of this indifference began to extend itself to the other spectators, and a youngster, who was just quitting the condition of a boy to enter the state of manhood, attempted to assist the termagant by flourishing his tomahawk before their victim, and adding his empty boast to the taunts of the women. Then, indeed, the captive turned his face toward the light, and looked down on the stripling with an expression that was superior to contempt. At the next moment he resumed his quiet and reclining attitude against the post. But the change of posture had permitted Duncan to exchange glances with the firm and piercing eyes of Uncas, breathless with amazement and heavily oppressed with the critical situation of his friend, Hayward recoiled before the look, trembling lest its meaning might in some unknown manner hasten the prisoner's fate. There was not, however, any instant cause for such an apprehension. Just then a warrior forced his way into the exasperated crowd. Motioning the woman and children aside with a stern gesture, he took Uncas by the arm and led him toward the door of the council lodge. Thither all the chiefs and most of the distinguished warriors followed, among whom the anxious Hayward found means to enter without attracting any dangerous attention to himself. A few moments were consumed in disposing of those present in a manner suitable to their rank and influence in the tribe. An order very similar to that adopted in the preceding interview was observed, the aged and superior chiefs occupying the area of the spacious apartment within the powerful light of a glaring torch, while their juniors and inferiors were arranged in the background, presenting a dark outline of swarthy marked visages. In the very center of the lodge, immediately under an opening that admitted the twinkling light of one or two stars, stood Uncas, calm, elevated, and collected. His high and haughty carriage was not lost on his captors, who often bent their looks on his person with eyes which, while they lost none of their inflexibility of purpose, plainly betrayed their admiration of the stranger's daring. The case was different with the individual whom Duncan had observed to stand forth with his friend previously to the desperate trial of speed, and who, instead of joining in the chase, had remained throughout its turbulent uproar like a cringing statue, expressive of shame and disgrace. Though not a hand had been extended to greet him, nor yet an eye had condescended to watch his movements, he had also entered the lodge, as though impelled by a fate to whose decrees he submitted, seemingly without a struggle. Hayward profited by the first opportunity to gaze in his face. Secretly apprehensive he might find the features of another acquaintance. But they proved to be those of a stranger, and, what was still more inexplicable, of one who bore all the distinctive marks of a Huron warrior. Instead of mingling with his tribe, however, he sat apart, a solitary being in a multitude his form shrinking into a crouching and abject attitude, as if anxious to fill as little space as possible. When each individual had taken his proper station, and silence reigned in the place, the gray-haired chief, already introduced to the reader, spoke aloud in the language of the Lenny Lenape. Delaware, he said, though one of a nation of women, you have proved yourself a man. I would give you food, but he who eats with a Huron should become his friend. Rest in peace till the morning sun, when our last words shall be spoken. Seven nights, and as many summer days, have I fasted on the trail of the Hurons, Uncas coldly replied. The children of the Lenape know how to travel the path of the just without lingering to eat. 
two of my young men are in pursuit of your companion resumed the other without appearing to regard the boast of his captive when they get back then will our wise man say to you live or die has the huron no ears scornfully exclaimed uncas twice since he has been your prisoner has the delaware heard a gun that he knows your young men will never come back a short and sullen pause succeeded this bold assertion duncan who understood the mohican to allude to the fatal rifle of the scout bent forward in earnest observation of the effect it might produce on the conquerors but the chief was content with simply retorting if the lenape are so skilful why is one of their bravest warriors here he followed the steps of a flying coward and fell into a snare the cunning beaver may be caught as uncas thus replied he pointed with his finger toward the solitary huron but without deigning to bestow any other notice on so unworthy an object the words of the answer and the air of the speaker produced a strong sensation among his auditors Every eye rolled sullenly toward the individual indicated by the simple gesture, and a low, threatening murmur passed through the crowd. The ominous sounds reached the outer door, and the women and children pressing into the throng no gap had been left between shoulder and shoulder that was not now filled with the dark lineaments of some eager and curious human countenance. In the meantime, the more aged chiefs in the center communed with each other in short and broken sentences. Not a word was uttered that did not convey the meaning of the speaker in the simplest and most energetic form. Again, a long and deeply solemn pause took place. It was known by all present to be the brave precursor of a weighty and important judgment. They who composed the outer circle of faces were on tiptoe to gaze, and even the culprit for an instant forgot his shame in a deeper emotion, and exposed his abject features in order to cast an anxious and troubled glance at the dark assemblage of chiefs. The silence was finally broken by the aged warrior so often named. He arose from the earth, and moving past the immovable form of Uncas, placed himself in a dignified attitude before the offender. At that moment the withered squall already mentioned moved into the circle in a slow, sidling sort of dance, holding the torch and muttering the indistinct words of what might have been a species of incantation. Though her presence was altogether an intrusion, it was unheeded. Approaching Uncas, she held the blazing brand in such a manner as to cast its red glare on his person, and to expose the slightest emotion of his countenance. The Mohican maintained his firm and haughty attitude and his eyes, so far from deigning to meet her inquisitive look, dwelt steadily on the distance, as though it penetrated the obstacles which impeded the view, and looked into futurity. Satisfied with her examination, she left him, with a slight expression of pleasure, and proceeded to practice the same trying experiment on her delinquent countrymen. The young Huron was in his war-paint, and very little of a finely molded form was concealed by his attire. The light rendered every limb and joint discernible, and Duncan turned away in horror when he saw they were writhing in irrepressible agony. The woman was commencing a low and plaintive howl at the sad and shameful spectacle, when the chief put forth his hand and gently pushed her aside. "'Read that bends,' he said, addressing the young culprit by name and in his proper language. Though the great spirit has made you pleasant to the eyes, it would have been better that you had not been born. Your tongue is loud in the village, but in battle it is still. None of my young men strike the tomahawk deeper into the war-post, none of them so lightly on the engase. The enemy know the shape of your back, but they have never seen the color of your eyes. Three times have they called on you to come, and as often did you forget to answer. Your name will never be mentioned again in our tribe. It is already forgotten. As the chief slowly uttered these words, 
pausing impressively between each sentence, the culprit raised his face, in deference to the other's rank and years. Shame, horror, and pride struggled in its lineaments. His eye, which was contracted with inward anguish, gleamed on the persons of those whose breath was his fame, and the latter emotion for an instant predominated. He arose to his feet, and bearing his bosom looked steadily on the keen glittering knife that was already upheld by his inexorable judge. As the weapon passed slowly into his heart, he even smiled, as if in joy at having found death less dreadful than he had anticipated, and fell heavily on his face at the feet of the rigid and unyielding form of Uncas. The squaw gave a loud and plaintive yell, dashed the torch to the earth, and buried everything in darkness. The whole shattering group of spectators glided from the lodge like troubled sprites, and Duncan thought that he and the yet throbbing body of the victim of an Indian judgment had now become its only tenants. End of chapter 23 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007.